And we're back. Welcome back from the weekend. Happy Tuesday. Uh, today, we will continue on uh, what we left off before. Before we begin, we'll go over some administrative bits. Uh, the reading, which is sections 1.1 to 1.11 uh, from the Operating Systems Concepts text, uh, uh, page 3 through 51, that reading is done, is due by the 3rd of September. That's Wednesday. Uh, homework one uh, is or has been on the blackboard for about a week, and it will be due uh, this evening on Tuesday, September 2nd, one second before midnight, 11.59 and 59 uh, seconds. Please make sure you pay attention to the questions and you answer them fully. So where we last left off, we talked about caching, and we said that caching is the use of a smaller, faster pool of memory or buffer to work in conjunction with a larger but slower pool of memory. And with this caching concept, we can improve the speed of access of a system, but also maintain a relatively high degree of storage. And we talked about a server cache in particular uh, we left off talking about Netflix. And this Netflix cache, well, if you have a machine, let's say more than one machine, on something like a campus network like DSU, and let's say these machines in DSU are connected in to a switch in a dormitory, for example, and that switch is connected in to a router, and that router is responsible for getting packets off of DSU's network into the internet service provider for DSU. So here's the ISP and into the internet. Now, on the other side of the internet, uh, there's Netflix's data center, and they're gonna have a router and firewalls and all sorts of the usual types of network devices. And hanging off of Netflix's router will be server instances that have databases, and these databases are going to contain uh, the movie content that you're streaming. Now, certainly, if some user one, so there's the first person, wants to watch a particular movie, and that person, uh, when they issue the request to go and watch a movie, the request goes all the way out off the network to Netflix, and the stream data comes in the reverse direction back onto DSU's network, and you see that on your browser as your TV show or your program or your content. Now, of course, let's say a second person on the network requests that content. That he or she is going to make that request. It's going to go out across the network to the internet to Netflix's data center, Netflix, and that streaming content is going to come back. Now, the problem is, is if you have a large number of users, that are requesting the same content, that movie, each time that request is gonna go across the network to across the internet to Netflix's server, and that content is loaded, comes back across the reverse path um, onto that machine. With the cache, well, we take and set up a specialized system, your cache, and that cache is gonna maintain a database and when your requests go out, in the caching case, that request goes to the cache server. The cache server checks for that content. If it exists in its database, it loads it into memory and sends it to you. And all of that traffic stays on DSU's network. If that content does not exist in the cache, well, this cache server goes out across the internet, retrieves that content from Netflix, loads it, stores it in the cache's database. So now that movie exists in that cache database on DSU's network. So any subsequent user who requests the same content, the same movie, instead of their request going all the way across the network and fetching this content from Netflix's data center, it's gonna fetch it locally. And what you perceive is that it happens much faster because you don't have to travel all that way across the network, that data, in order uh, to retrieve that content. And so network, Netflix Open Connect is the name of the cache server. 
for Netflix, and it's uh, a product uh, that they uh, allow certain users uh, to have because it ends up resulting in a savings both in time and speed of access and responsiveness, as well as the amount of traffic that goes across the network. Because once this content is in the cache server on DSU's network, you save all of that bandwidth going back and forth across the internet to DSU's access link in order to push that content to each one of these browsers. Okay, so that's where we left off. Let's continue on. So we talked about this idea of a computer system as consisting of a CPU. So I'll just write in CPU here, a CPU. And that CPU interacts with device controllers, IO device controllers, uh, each one of which has a buffer. And we said that the CPU's responsibility is to take that information from the device controller and store it in memory to transfer it and also take that information from memory and to send it out to another IO device buffer controller's buffer. And so all of these devices are operating in parallel and the CPU orchestrates this. Now certainly when the CPU is orchestrating this, well, the CPU can only fetch so many bytes at a time. What if you have a device that deals with a lot of high traffic data? So take your audio visual stream, for example. If you're taking a small number of bytes at a time, into your CPU from that device and from your CPU to RAM, well, that can be quite a bottleneck and introduce a slowdown. Now, how can you make this faster? Using something called direct memory access. And what direct memory access does is it allows the CPU to set up a pathway, but when the transfer comes, the CPU is not involved. It's a direct transfer from that I.O. device buffer to RAM directly. And because it's direct, you can transfer an entire block of data instead of getting small chunks at a time. So direct memory access is used for high-speed I.O. devices and it allows you to transmit information at, cl as, at close to the speed of memory. Because it's direct from the I.O. device's buffer, which is a type of memory, to RAM, which is memory. The bottleneck for this direct memory access, direct from the device buffer to RAM, to memory, is gonna be the bus. So it's close to memory speed because you don't have the CPU in the middle arbitrating, taking a little bit of data from the device, sending it to memory, take another little bit of data from the device, sending it to memory, and so forth. And so the device controller with direct memory access, or DMA, uh, is going to transfer blocks of data from its buffer storage directly to main memory without the CPU intervening. And that's really, really important, this without CPU intervention. And the good news is every time the CPU transfers data, it requires an interrupt because it's interrupt driven to signal to the CPU that this device buffer is done transferring this data. Now, the beauty of direct memory access is that the cost of interrupt only happens once for the entire bulk data transfer of the entire block. And so with DMA or direct memory access, only one interrupt is generated per block instead of each byte at a time or every few bytes at a time. And that results in a savings in time, which means that it is much faster for such transfers. So this is uh, a schematic, and this is in the book, and it talks about the relationship between the interrupt, the CPU, uh, and uh, the memory. And so for CPU-mediated uh, transfer, we have instructions and data, and we have the CPU. It's pulling in instructions from your program, so you have some program in memory, in your main memory, and this program also has some data associated with it. Now, of course, we talked about instruction cache and a data cache. And so this CPU will pull in chunks of your program into your instruction cache. So this is a little piece of your program. Let's call it P prime. And it'll also pull in chunks of your data for your program. And let's call that D prime, a little piece of your data from that program. 
And now it'll start executing instructions from the instruction cache because it's faster than reading it from memory, every single instruction access. And it'll use this data as it needs. And so this data can either be from the direction from memory to the CPU or from the CPU into memory. So sometimes the CPU loads data, sometimes the CPU writes data to memory. Okay, so now let's pretend then that the CPU executes some command from your program and it makes a so-called IO request, like read uh, some data from the network card or read data from the disk drive. Okay, well, it makes this IO request and how the operating system signals that this IO request is transfer of data between the buffer uh, for the IO device, here's our buffer, is done transferring is through an interrupt, okay? So the IO request occurs and as data travels from your IO device buffer to the CPU, and then the CPU is signaled that this device is done, that transfer from its buffer to the CPU is done with an interrupt. So then the CPU says, okay, I'm done getting data from this device. Let me go ahead and push this new data into memory. Okay, likewise, if this data is being sent to an IO device, you wanna send data across a network through the network card, well, an IO, the data gets pulled in by the CPU, the IO request happens, data gets pulled in from memory into the data cache. The data is transferred to the device and an IO, an interrupt request occurs when the transfer is done. So whether the data is coming from the device, IO device buffer to the CPU into memory or from memory to the CPU to the device, um, this is called CPU mediated transfer. Now, of course, the CPU only has so much storage in its register file and its data cache, right? Remember, this is a very relatively small amount of buffer space that the CPU has. And so only small chunks of data at a time are gonna be transferred from this IO device into the CPU, ultimately getting ushered into memory using the CPU mediated transfer. But if your device has a lot of data that it wants to send to memory, there's a problem here and that's where DMA really benefits. So for DMA block transfer, all the CPU does is it sets up the plumbing, sets up the pathway, some addresses, some buffers, pointers, and things like that. And it tells this device, okay, well, this is the device, i.e. memory, where you wanna send data. And this is the location or the address in memory where you want that data to be put. Go ahead and send it. Okay, so this device then, let's say it's a network device, you have data coming in. Its device buffer fills up with data as it comes in across the network. The CPU initiates an IO request this data gives it the pathways, the pointers, and so forth. The DMA transfer happens directly from the device, IO device buffer to that location in RAM. It's written out. And when this block of data is, completely, is, is completed in terms of its writing, then the interrupt is signaled to the CPU to let it know, okay, the device has finished transferring. And so the DMA block transfer the nice thing about it, the savings, is that you only have a single interrupt for an entire block of data instead of an interrupt for every single chunk of data as you had in the CPU mediated transfer on the previous slide. Okay, so let's switch gears here and talk a little bit about computer system architecture. Now we talked about the von Neumann architecture, but we didn't talk a lot about some of variations and nuances you can have concerning the CPU. And so most systems or earlier systems use a single so-called general purpose processor. That was your CPU. And most systems or some have special purpose processors as well, certain features or types of computations. 
And there are so-called multiprocessor systems that are more popular now, also known as parallel systems or tightly coupled systems that have more than one processor on board. Now, you might be asking, well, what's the reason for this? If you have more units of work crutching away on a problem, you can increase the throughput or the amount of work being done. You can also get so-called economies of scale. It's much cheaper and more efficient if you have more units of work going than if you have one. You can also get so called increased reliability. If you have a lot of work to do, right, the amount of time it takes to handle that work, it's roughly the same regardless of if you have a little bit of work or a lot of work because you, your performance uh, capability uh, scales. Also, if you have something that breaks down, let's say you overload your system, the ability to handle that work degrades more gracefully if you have more than one processor, more than one unit of work working at the same time. You also get a semblance of fault tolerance. If something breaks, you have many other units of work that can take over uh, from that broken uh, single processor. There are two major flavors of multiprocessing. One is so-called asymmetric multiprocessing, and the other is symmetric multiprocessing. With asymmetric multiprocessing, each processor is assigned a special type of task. So imagine every time you had uh, an addition or subtraction problem, arithmetic, uh, it would be sent to one processor. Every time you had a floating point operation, it'd be sent to another processor, right? So they're all specialists, each processor, depending on the type of operation. That's an asymmetric multiprocessing system. And there are also symmetric multiprocessing systems. That's where each processor is a generalist. So each unit of work, each CPU, can do, in the example I just mentioned about floating point versus arithmetic, each processor has the ability to do both arithmetic as well as floating point operation. Okay, that's called symmetric multiprocessing. So this is a picture of what a wafer of silicon that's been processed upon which processors uh, have been um, um, have been implemented or have been built, right? And so each one of these squares in this wafer is a single processor. And let me see if I can um, draw one of them, right? So there is a single microprocessor. And so this wafer is laser cut and each one of those laser cut processors from that large circular wafer if we were to blow it up, this in particular is a quad core uh, processor. And so here is one of the cores, right? There's another core. It kind of looks like a, a, an urban scene at night uh, from the sky. Here's another core. Let's see if I can find it over here. And here's another core. And so I don't recall all the parts of it, but this certainly looks like uh, some sort of cache or memory. And then this looks like a controller uh, to arbitrate uh, the sending and receiving of data between processors. So this is a quad core. And you take one of these, this is an actual chip itself. So this is the actual computer chip. And that chip is put in what's called a pad frame. This is a pad frame. frame. And that pad frame has a bunch of conductors. And let me get my other pen. Each of these tiny wires is a signal carrying conductor. I don't know why that's popped up. Each one of these tiny wires, select my pen color, blue. Each one of these tiny wires, that's better, is a signal conduct is a conductor. And when you put this chip on the pad frame, it makes an electrical contact to various conductor points on the chip. And then this pad frame, this the, the chip is and or soldered rather, uh, and a cap is put on this. And that's the chip that you see. And this particular chip is the Intel I7 chip. 
Now, the underside of this pad frame looks like the following. You have a bunch of conductors and other discrete components, transistors and other things like that. And this chip, you can imagine when you're pushing a lot of uh, data through it and getting a lot of data out, it corresponds to ones plus five volts and zeros, zero volts, that's changing very rapidly. Now, when you push a lot of signal energy through a small space, it tends to heat up. And so here, these pictures uh, are um, heat sinks, these metal ribbed cooling fans, they're heat sinks, and they're used to conduct or pull away the heat off that chip uh, to keep it cool. And they often have like fans attached to them. And here's a cooling fan to vent that air, the hot air, away from uh, the chip uh, to keep it cool so your system continues running. This uh, impressive looking uh, assembly, that's a much more substantial heat sink, but this heat sink uh, is liquid cool. And so these metal tubes have a liquid uh, inside of them, and that liquid is actively cooled taking away the heat from this heat sink uh, to keep your CPU, your, your processor, much, much cooler. Now, of course, a liquid-cooled heat sink is going to cost you a lot more because you have to pay for that engineering. Okay, so this is an example of a symmetric multiprocessing architecture. Multiprocessor is not the same as multi-core. Let me write that out. Multiprocessor processor is not equal to multi-core. They're not the same thing. This is a multi-processing system architecture. So multi-processor, we have our bus, we has our, have our memory, we also have our I.O. controller, right? And that I.O. controller, like we discussed before, is going to have a buffer, and you're going to have your I.O. device, like maybe this is a disk controller, and we have our hard drive attached to it, hard drive. So we have a typical von Neumann architecture. And attached to this bus, we have more than one CPU, and in this case, this gray box represents one chip. So here's the first chip with the first CPU in the pad frame, the actual processor. Here's the second chip, and here is the third chip. So if by chip, what I mean is one of these, one of these Intel i7s. And so you could have multiple heat sinks, one heat sink for the first chip, another heat sink for the second chip, another heat sink for the third chip. Okay, so we have multiple chips, and each chip, as a chip, it has registers, uh, and it has its instruction cache and data cache, and they're connected via the bus to all the other I.O. devices and memory. Okay, so a multi-core system is depicted here. In this figure, we have one chip, so chip number one. And on that single chip, you have two cores. Now, we showed an example of that here, this is a single chip, and we have, here's my first core, here's my second core, here's my third core, here's my fourth core. And so this is an example of a core. And that's precisely what we have here, this multi-core system. We have a single chip. Here's the zeroth core. Here's the first core. Each one of these cores has a set of registers, and it's cache and all the usual parts of a CPU. And so a multi-core system has chips on which you have more than one core. Now, certainly you can wire your memory to the different uh, interfaces uh, to the bus so you can have multiple pathways uh, to memory uh, from each of the cores on the same chip. And so with a multi-core system, each chip has more than one core on board. Now, like a multiprocessor system, a clustered system has multiple processors, but each node or unit of work in the cluster is a separate machine. 
right? And so you have one CPU, for example, and that's connected in a von Neumann architecture to memory. And then you're going to have your I.O. as usual. And this is going to be a single machine, single box. And that's going to be connected through the network to another box or machine. Right? And that's going to be another instance of the von Neumann architecture. And so for a cluster, typically, you're going to share storage through some high-speed uh, so-called storage area network. It's going to be uh, an array of disks uh, connected to processors, connected to the network, and this really powerful disk uh, server is going to have a connection via the network to all of these machine instances uh, through a high-speed network. Here's your network. Okay. And so clustered systems typically provide what's called high availability service because you have all these machine instances, all these boxes. So you might have a second box, a third box, a fourth box, and so forth. And because you have so many machines, well, it's very unlikely they're all going to break at the same time. In aggregate, you're always going to have some machine available to do work for you. Now, if you're somebody like Amazon and these machines are running instances uh, of the online shopping experience, that means to the outside world, these Amazon shopping sites will always be available for people to use. Now, that means that should you get a failure in one part of your system, maybe this machine crashes and that machine crashes, well, the other two are still available uh, for service, right? Uh, so it's much more robust. Now, asymmetric clustering typically has one machine in standby mode. The machine's only purpose is to be that spare that takes over should the primary machine fail. Symmetric clustering has multiple nodes running applications and monitoring each other. So with the symmetric case, they're all running the ability to do the same things, uh, and they're just kind of looking at one another. They're monitored to see, okay, well, do you have more work than me? Then let me take some of your work, uh, some of the requests coming in, and so forth. And so some clusters are specifically designed for high-performance computing to compute really large data sets and get results very, very fast. Now, for these specialized high-performance computing clusters, or HPC clusters, you have to write the applications in a very special way to take advantage of this parallelism, to take advantage of the fact that you have a lot of machines around. So what does that mean? Well, what that means is if you have a problem and you want to submit that problem to your cluster, and let's draw the cluster as a cloud, what that means is you have to send it to some part of the cluster that knows how to break up this problem into pieces such that these pieces can be solved or handled or taken by each one of these machine instances in your cluster. Because one way to speed up a big problem is to chop it up in pieces and then solve each one of these pieces, take your results, and assemble all those partial results into a single solution. Okay? And so some clusters, when you write these high performance applications, you often have to write them specially so that you can chop these programs up and scatter the, the sub problems, solve them, and integrate the partial solutions into a total solution. Now, certainly in the clustered systems, you're going to have some machines that multiple requests are going to want to make use of. And as such, you have to order the request going to those machines so that you have the machine only working on one problem at a time. And this is accomplished, this ordered execution, by so-called lock manager. And in a cluster, you have a distributed version of lock manager. It's aware of what tasks are executing on which machine instances, and it holds off on assigning new tasks until that machine instance uh, is done with the existing task. And so these distributed lock managers 
uh, solve this problem, these conflicting operations, by implementing the orderly assignment of tasks uh, to machine instances uh, in a cluster. Okay, so this is a schematic of what a clustered system looks like. You have a storage area network, which is nothing more than a big storage array, a large number of disks uh, that can be accessed very quickly uh, over a network. And you have separate machines, separate boxes, each one of which could be a uh, multiprocessor. And they are connected through a high-speed network uh, or interconnect. And so these clustered systems are interconnected by a high-speed network called an interconnect, and they can work together on parts of a problem as if it were a single computer. Now, certainly after you take an operating systems course at the undergrad level, uh, they have distributed operating systems courses uh, where you'll study uh, the special class of algorithms uh, that are used uh, to coordinate all of these resources uh, as if they were a single system instance. So take, for example, you know, things like uh, Google Maps or Google Street View. You're making use of a clustered system. Different aspects of that application are being handled by different machine instances in a data center, but to you, it looks like it's a single application that's running. Okay, so let's take a look further at the way you interact with your operating system, so-called multi-programming or batch systems. Now, batch systems is a fairly old construct when computers were very expensive and they had a big powerful computer in a room somewhere called a mainframe uh, service operating room and you had terminals connected, you would submit your programs to this machine, right? And so in that operating regime, a single user isn't able to keep the CPU and I.O. devices busy all the time. And so it was the responsibility of the multi-programming operating system, multi-programming because there were multiple programs running, the code and the data, so that the CPU always has something to do. The goal was to keep the CPU busy. And so a subset of all of the programs or jobs, as they were called, available on the system, you could have easily you know, 50 people in a computer room, 100 people in a computer room, had programs that they would submit to the system, a subset of all the total jobs uh, were kept in memory. So one of them, one of the programs would be selected and it would be run. And the special part of the operating system that did that was called the job scheduler. And it would run your program until it had to wait for some IO. And when it had to wait for some IO in your program, it would switch to a different job. And once the I.O. operation was complete that your program had to run, interrupt would happen, and the program would then be considered among all the other jobs uh, that were waiting uh, for execution on the CPO. And so this multi-program was the earlier days of operating systems, uh, but concepts from multi-programming are still uh, actively implemented and you see them in modern operating systems. So then that came to a so-called time-sharing system. And with this time sharing system, it, the, it was an extension of multi-programming. And the idea was to have interactivity among all of the 50 to 100 users that were attached to that same mainframe big computer uh, at the same time. And so what would happen is the CPU would give each person a tiny bit of time, usually uh, less than a second, uh, to run on the CPU and it would switch to another one, switch to another one, switch to another one. So the CPU would then switch between jobs so frequently that the users can actively in their terminal or at their terminal or console interact with each job while it was running. Previously with batch mode um, sharing of machine, you didn't interact with it. You'd submit it and then you'd get a printout that was the result of your program executing. So time sharing solved that and made it more interactive by giving each person a fractional amount of time uh, on uh, the CPO. And so each user has at least one program that's executing in memory. A program in execution is called a process. A process is different from a program. Program is the code listing all the instructions that you want your computation to do. But the process is the active representation of a program. So each user has one program executing in memory, a so-called process. And if several jobs or tasks were ready to run at the same time, the CPU would do scheduling. It would switch 
from one process to the next and the next and the next and the next. And if all of the processes couldn't fit in memory, the running programs, it would swap them in and out of memory to a special location on disk. And so this idea of swapping in and out of memory to disk is called virtual memory. Is virtual memory allows for the executions of processes that are not completely in memory. And in fact, what we'll learn in this class is how the operating system keeps only parts of your program in memory, but other parts of your program on disk. Okay. So this is the layout for a multi-program system. We had many jobs, and we have the operating system in the so-called low part of memory. Now, I know it's on top, how you call it low part of memory, but if you look at the memory addresses associated uh, with these jobs that are residents or present in memory, well, what do you see here? Well, the memory has a bunch of numbers or addresses that identify locations in RAM. So it goes from zero to some maximum number. Now, it's listed at top, but it's called the bottom because it's the smallest memory address. Oftentimes, when you see memory written in diagrams in the literature, you'll see the smallest memory address at the bottom and the largest memory address, 512 meg in this example, at the top. So if we were to draw it this other way, you'd have the operating system at the bottom. You'd have job one, then job two, and so forth. Okay. And so this operating system is resident in the bottom part of memory, right, the smallest address, and all of the jobs are in memory um, after that. Okay. So an operating system, when it operates, we had said before uh, that it's so-called interrupt-driven. Uh, you have both hardware and software interrupts. Hardware interrupts are triggered by devices, where the software interrupts are exceptions, which are used for error reporting, um, or traps, which are used for operating system services. So other process issues that involve uh, interrupts have to do with things like a process that's in an infinite loop. So if you're in an infinite loop and your instructions are executing on the CPU, how do you stop this thing? Well, what happens? Well, the system sets a timer and says, okay, if you're still running after this amount of time, I'm going to stop you. I'm not going to allow you uh, to infinitely use all of the CPU resources. Okay. So increasingly, there are CPUs that support different modes of operation. These are called uh, multi-mode operation. And one example of a CPU that supports this uh, is for virtual machine managers. And this is so that you have support for a virtual machine, we can run different operating systems on the same machine, and a virtual machine is a software construct. But here, with a special mode, you're allowing these operating system instances to each have low-level privileged access to the underlying machine. So that's a, a specialized thing. So whenever you want to prevent an infinite loop, i.e. a process hogging all of the CPU resources, this idea of firing an interrupt to stop it uh, switches between what's called user mode and kernel mode, right? Um, this infinite loop is a dangerous thing because it means that a machine can take up 100% of the resources on a processor. So what happens with this type of interrupt? Well, you have a timer, and the timer is set so that the processor, the CPU, will be interrupted from what it was doing after some unit of time. Let's call it delta T. And so you have a counter variable, and that counter variable is decremented by a physical clock. And when that counter reaches zero, the operating system sets it, an interrupt is generated by your system. And so what happens is that when that interrupt fires, you set up a scheduling process to switch to a different program that needs to execute. But before it sets it up, it needs to set aside where the current program left off. So you're going to be saving all of that register information and cache information, so the instruction cache, the data cache, 
uh, and uh, what the ALU was right about to do. Another type of interrupt, a trap occurs when you make a system call. Now, system calls are a set of APIs or functions made available by your operating system kernel to allow the kernel to execute a dangerous or privileged instruction on behalf uh, of that application. So we have a user program here in this diagram, this is in the book, and it's executing. It's just running uh, instructions and trafficking in data both to and from uh, main memory to the CPU. And then you call a system call. You say file read, right? Now file read wants to write to the disk and there are many ways that you can mess with uh, the information for another program. So the kernel says, okay, I'm going to do it on your behalf, do it for you. So when a program calls file read, what does it do? It gives the name of the file and it gives the data it, uh, and the location where it wants to load that data once it's read. And if it's a, something like a file write, it gives the name of the file and it gives the data that it wants to write to that file. So you initiate that system call. And when you call that system call, the implementation of that system call is made available by the operating system kernel. And it says, oh, well, you're trying to call a privileged information. I'm going to generate this interrupt. So what happens? This interrupt occurs, a software interrupt, it's called a trap. And there's a notion of a mode bit. That mode bit toggles between one and zero. And when a mode bit is set to one, there are certain operations that physically cannot be executed. So when this trap occurs, well, the mode bit changes from one to zero, and now control is passed to the operating system kernel, and it's the operating system kernel that executes the implementation of whatever it is the system call does, low level with all of the IO devices and the bus and so forth. So the system call goes ahead and interacts with the I.O. controller for the disk, spins up the hard drive platters, initiates, for example, the DMA transfer, block transfer, and then the transfer is done, and the system call exits. When you return from this system call, the trap or the service routine for this trap, the mode bit is set back to one, and then execution returns back to whatever statement is after the system call in your user process, and then execution continues. And so this trap is the kernel's way of protecting the system from any potentially damaging operation that an application may make because it has full access to the low-level uh, parts of the system. And so this mode bit is the mechanism used to protect uh, the sensitive parts of the of the system uh, from user processes, and moreover, because the operating system kernel is doing this on behalf of the user process, it only executes what it's supposed to, i.e., to read or write, and not, hey, let's look at the other part of the disk that has nothing to do with what we're trying to read or write. Okay, so let's take a look at process management. We said a process is the name of a program in execution. It's a unit of work within the system, whereas a program is a passive entity. A process is active. A process is actually running. A program is just data and instructions that are sitting on disk. Now, as an entity that's running, that process needs some resources in order to accomplish what it's out to do. It runs, so it needs the CPU. It stores information and reads information, so it needs memory. It interacts with input and output, so it needs the I.O. Uh, device controllers. It might need files. It also might need initialization data where to start. Likewise, when a process exits, all of those resources, CPU, memory, I.O., files, and so forth, need to be reclaimed by the operating system. So if you were to open a file and start writing it, well, you need to close that file and stop writing it, for example. So let's consider the CPU that we talked about in our von Neumann architecture. 
I'm going to go down here and let me select a pen color. I think I'm going to choose blue. Okay. So now we said, I'm going to draw this pretty big. We have our CPU. CPU. And our CPU had subsystems on board. We had an arithmetic logic unit, or ALU. And that is responsible for arithmetic operations. We have a floating point unit, FPU. We also have some registers, registers, register file, and the register file contained uh, some very high speed storage for storing intermediate values. We also have the instruction cache, which stores pieces of your program code. We also have the data cache, which stores pieces of the data that your program code uses. We also have something called your flags. And the flags register is responsible for checking when something is zero, if something is greater than or equal to, and so forth. And then we also have this thing called the program counter. And the program counter contains a memory address referencing uh, the next address for the next instruction that your program is going to execute. So now, this is our CPU. Let's draw our main memory. And we said the CPU was connected to the main memory through the system bus. So this is our memory. And here's our system bus. Let me just draw the bus. We have our I.O. controller. And let's just assume the I.O. controller is connected to the disk. So we have a disk controller. That I.O. controller has a buffer. And connected to this particular I.O. controller, because it's a disk controller, we're going to have our hard drive. OK. Now, this is our hard drive. All right. So on our disk, let me make sure I have my connections connecting our memory to the bus and connecting the CPU to the bus. So on your hard drive, in the beginning, you have your program. You also have your operating system, because it's just a program running on your disk. You power on your machine, and after checking uh, the different parts of the device to make sure they're working properly, the operating system is loaded into memory from the I.O. buffer by the bootstrap loader. And here's your operating system running, and it's resident in memory. So the first thing that happens when you run your operating system, maybe you double click on an icon, and that icon, double click on the icon, forces the program to be loaded through the buffer into memory. Here's your program. So you might not just have one program. Maybe that's the first program. That might be, say, hmm, MS. Word, and maybe you have another program. Maybe that's your browser uh, program two. Maybe that's Firefox, the internet browser. Okay, so now you have these programs running, and let's say you double clicked on Firefox, double clicked on MS Word, MS Word is running. So that means pieces of MS Word are going to be loaded into the instruction cache. MS Word, I'll say MS, and maybe the document data is going to be in your data cache. So here's your document doc. Okay. Likewise, pieces of Firefox are going to be loaded, Firefox, into your instruction cache, and then maybe the start page web data, so start page, is going to be loaded in your data cache. So then what happens? Okay, so you're running something, you're running something from, uh, say, MS Word, and MS Word is doing some calculations that fills the register file with the data for intermediate values. It performs some arithmetic uh, operations, some floating point operations. It's uh, sending your flag, the program counter is updating, referencing that part of MS Word that you're running. It's taking those instructions out of the instruction cache and propagating it correctly to the different parts of the CPU. So now, if I wanted to switch from Microsoft Word to Firefox, now let Firefox run on the CPU, well, we have intermediate information 
in a number of places at this juncture. And let me uh, outline that in red. So what do we have? We have program counter information because when we switch from Microsoft Word to Firefox, we want our program counter to now point to regions of Firefox that we're gonna execute. We also have the flags that we had for Microsoft Word, they have to go somewhere because we're gonna now have those flags change as a result of execution of Firefox. So we need to save off the program counter that pointed the word, the flags values where we left off when running Microsoft Word, the register file, and which instructions we had set up in the ALU, floating point unit, and so forth. So what do we do? We take this instance, and let's call that the system state, and we write down that system state, the register file information, uh, the flag information, the program counter information, and the instruction cache and data cache, maybe some of that information as well. We take that state, and then we write it somewhere in the disk. Or we could keep that state in memory. So if we kept it on disk, we put it down here. Or if we keep it in memory, we write that state here. So now, once we write that state down somewhere, we can now switch to the instructions for Firefox. That might mean reading it out of the instruction cache or loading the instruction cache anew with parts of the Firefox program and the data cache as well with data from for, for Firefox. And now we start executing the Firefox stuff. And so a process represents the current state of all the parts of the CPU as a result of running a program. That includes the data, it includes the instruction, it includes the intermediate values, the flags resulting from operations, as well as the program counter that references where in this program we're gonna execute our next instruction. And so this state identifies what it means to be a program in execution, and the state has a word that will is a name that we'll talk about later called the process status word, right? It's the state that defines the execution of a program. So this is our process, and we'll talk in more detail about the process status word components of it, and what a process does. And so when we talk about process management, we talk about the switching of the state associated with a program in execution from one program, like MS Word, to another program, like Firefox. Now, certainly you have more than two programs running on your system, but the process management talks about how you handle all of this execution state and how you switch the execution state when you're switching from one program's time on the CPU to another program's time on the CPU. So a single threaded process has only a single program counter, meaning it only executes one location at a time in your program. And it specifies the location of the next instruction within the program code to execute. A process executes instructions sequentially one statement at a time. So if you have a program and it says print as the first command, and it says if A is less than one, then do something. So it executes the first statement. It remembers with the program counter that the next instruction is going to be that next statement in your program code, right? So that's the role of the program counter to specify the next location within memory. So I'll just write there in memory where it will find the next instruction in the program code to execute. And it's done sequentially one instruction after the other. Now, conversely, there are so-called multi-threaded processes. You can have more than one program counter. So what does it mean to have more than one program counter? Well, if you have multiple functions, the function one in a program, I'll just say open, close, curly brace, first function, function two, 
open closed curly brace for the second function. So these are two functions in these small rectangles that define different function calls in my program. Now, if I have two PCs, two program counters, so this is my CPU, CPU, I have program counter number one and program counter number two. That means I can have the first memory location representing that program, another memory location location representing that program. So that means I can have two functions executing at the same time. Now, a thread of execution represents all of those pieces of information on a CPU that I need in order to sequentially execute statements in a program. And so what do I need to do that? Okay, well, let's go back to the previous diagram. Maybe I'll just draw a little bit of it here. We have our CPU. Okay, now we had a program counter. Now we said that the program counter results when you execute a statement in intermediate values. So we have our register file that stores inter intermediate values. So that's my register file. And then I also have flags. The flags represent the result of certain operations, like if something was zero, if something's greater than, less than, and so forth. So these pieces, the program counter, the flags, and the register file, represent what's called the execution, execution context. It's all of the information I need on the CPU to describe, i.e. the context, of an execution, to describe an execution. And so when I have a multi-threaded process, I have a program in execution that has more than one of these execution contexts. So I can remember more than one set of the register file, the program counter, and the flags. I take that, that's one copy, represents everything I need to execute function one. I have another copy that represents all the information on the CPU I need associated with the other function. And so a thread is nothing more than an execution context. And when you have a process that has multiple threads, a so-called multi-threaded process, it means you can have more than one execution context or function running on the CPU at the same time. Now, certainly under the covers, if you have a multi-core system, they're physically running at the same time. If you have a single core uh, uh, CPU, that means it's switching among these execution contexts. And then you have what's called thread scheduling. So typically on a system, you have more, many processes and you have some user processes meaning associated with your programs, and you have some operating systems processes, and they're all running at the same time, or the illusion of running on the same time, at the same time, concurrently, on one or more CPUs, or one or more cores on a CPU. And so essentially, how you achieve this concurrency, right, running at the same time, is by multiplexing or sharing the CPUs among different processes, programs, and executions, and threads, i.e. the execution contexts within a process. Okay, so I'm gonna end there and we'll pick back up with the balance of process management uh, on Thursday. Uh, so I will see you Thursday and as usual, stay healthy and stay safe.